All right, praise God. I'm excited to share God's word today. We took a, I took a little break last week. We had a little bit of a different service last week where we just, uh, we had some um, praise and, and uh, we sang together and we shared, um, you know, uh, Acciones de Gracia, right? Praise reports. Um, and uh, we prayed together as a church. So, uh, so thank you to those that were here, those that missed it. You missed out because it was great. Um, the kids can go ahead and go out to their class as, um, as we get ready to uh, study God's word this afternoon. <clears throat> All right, but today I'm excited to uh, share with you a message that I have titled Amazing Grace, um, and um, I want to um, just share, you know, some, some of the foundational truths or the foundational truth of our faith um, in Christ, which is the fact that, that we're not saved by our own effort or merit, but by God's amazing grace, and we just, we just sang about that. Um, I don't know if you've ever had this experience growing up, or perhaps you've had this experience now with your children or when they were little, but I remember growing up, you know, whether we went on a day trip or uh, íbamos al campo, right, in Puerto Rico, and then driving back home, it was a, a pretty, you know, long ride, and I, I always remember either falling asleep in the car um, or, you know, if we were doing something, falling asleep in the car, but then waking up in the morning in my bed with my pajamas on and everything else, right, and not knowing how I made that transition. And I don't know how many of you, I do that with my son now. He doesn't fall asleep in the car often unless he's completely exhausted, right? Like when we went to Holiday World uh, a couple of years back and he played a ton and he was just out where like I had to like raise his wrist a couple of times and see if he was still breathing. Uh, but, um, but you, you know, you grab your kid and you take him from the car and you make that transfer. They have no idea. And that's just a beautiful image of what God's grace is, right? Is, is going from one place to another without any of your effort, but, uh, right, the effort of, of my father. I remember my father carrying me, right, or I'm told, or I, I remember me carrying my son and, and carrying him from one place to another without any effort on his part. And, um, you know, waking up with pajamas on, right? I didn't have pajamas on, but waking up. So, so my father or, or, you know, in the whole transition, um, you know, you, you change the person in order to be adequate for the, um, you know, for whatever is going on. And, and again, that's a beautiful image of God's grace, again, where, um, where we are carried from one place. We're taken from one place to another only because of the grace of our God. And, and it is, it really is the grace of God that separates Christianity from every other belief system, every other religion, every other uh, doctrine around the world. I have studied several major religions around the world, and what they all have in common is that it's all about you. It's all about your effort, your merit, your sacrifice, your faithfulness, and all these different things. And at the end of the day, you don't even have the assurance of your salvation. You have to weigh in to see if your good deeds have outweighed your bad deeds. And then we'll see, right, once you enter into that eternity space or whatever. But when it comes to Christianity, we are alone in the fact that it has nothing to do with us. But it's all because of God's grace. It's all because of God has done forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our soul is a free gift that cannot be earned, it cannot be gained, it can't be accomplished or purchased. You can't attain it in every single way, uh, in any single way. It can only be received, received. And when you think about it, when you think about a gift, if somebody gives you a gift and you try to pay them for it, it's no longer a gift. You're purchasing that gift. If somebody tries to give you a gift, but then you're like, oh, well, I got to do something then you're trying to earn that gift. Right now it becomes a prize. It's no longer a gift. And that's why God's grace, it's a gift. There's nothing that we can do to earn it, to achieve it, to purchase it, to attain it. All we can do is receive it with gratitude, with worship, 
and then um, it becomes and becomes ours. So with that said, just as a brief introduction, let us go ahead and pray um, so that God can lead us and help us understand this amazing, amazing truth of his amazing grace. Amen. Oramos. Father, um, I once again want to thank you for this time and for this space that you give us to God to to be intentional, God, to, to worship you, again, with our thoughts, with our, our, our words. Uh, the music is over, God, but, but now we want to continue to worship you by offering you our attention, by offering you our focus, by offering you, God, just uh, the, the fact of being present, of being vulnerable before you. So if you want to speak to us today, we are we're listening, God. We are here for it. So in, 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 um, in Jesus' name, God, I pray that, uh, like every single week, that what I share here today are not simply my thoughts or my ideas, but I pray that you would filter anything and everything that I'd say through your Holy Spirit so that, is, so that it's what your people, what your church needs to hear. Speak to us, Lord, in a clear, powerful, and personal way so that we may leave this place with a better understanding, with a deeper faith and confidence in your goodness and your word and your promises. But God, may we leave this place different than how we came because, God, you, you don't want to just fill us with information. God, you want transformation. You want to change us for your glory and for our good. And God, I pray all these things and I give you thanks and I do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So God's grace is unattainable. You can't achieve it. You can't earn it. You can't purchase it. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how much influence, power, authority. It doesn't matter. It's a free gift. And what's interesting to me is that that's the issue that a lot of people have with Christianity. Uh, some say that that's too easy. It's too easy. It can't be just by faith. It can't be just free, right? Um, and I believe it's because as a human race, uh, we, we love progress, do we not? I mean, sure, nobody has as a personal goal to feel stuck, to be stuck, right? We all want to grow. We want to develop. We want to advance in every single area, right? We want to grow and, and advance and, and be better financially or relationally or, or professionally or even physically, right? We don't want our, our health to deteriorate. We want to be stronger, you know, and, and better physically, and, and we want to grow professionally in every single way. And um, the quickest way for us to determine if we are growing, if we are developing, if we are advancing, is to, to measure ourselves, right? To measure, to, to um, you know, to, to take inventory, to, to compare ourselves. And um, the problem lies is that because we are sinful, when we measure and when we compare, unfortunately, we don't just compare ourselves to our past selves. But today, more than ever, what do we do? We compare ourselves to other people. Again, especially today, since we have access to so many people, to their pictures, to what they do and, and what they do with their families and their marriages and their vacations and stuff like that. And often we, we compare ourselves to them. And, and um, unfortunately, comparing is always a trap because it's, it's something that we're always going to lose. We're always, comparison will always lead us to sin, right? Because if we compare ourselves to somebody and we find out that, that their status or their situation maybe is not as good as ours, like we, we're better off or we're, we know better in a certain area or, or farther ahead in a certain area, we tend to at times get kind of prideful about it, which is sinful. That's what kicked Satan out of heaven, right, it was pride. But again, if we compare ourselves to other people and then we see that that they're doing better than we are and they have a nicer car and they take nicer vacations, so they do things together with their family or their marriage seems better than ours or their relationship or whatever, then what do we get? We get then discontent. We get envious. We get, you know, kind of a little bit bitter or perhaps a little bit of, you know, just discontentment or discouraged in our lives. And, and our spiritual life is, is no exception. 
Unfortunately, we too can compare ourselves to other people, you know, whether it is in our church or, um, you know, in our small groups or just people that we know at work that are followers of Christ or, or just things or looking at churches on Instagram or this or the other. And we compare ourselves, we compare our ministry, we compare different things. And again, we can get full of pride. If we find out that perhaps we're a little farther ahead, I trust the Lord a little bit more. I see the faithfulness of God in my life, you know, and his promises and his goodness in my life than someone else. We can at times get full of pride. Or again, if we see somebody else that is being blessed, that God is with them and advancing them or they're gifted in a certain area. Again, we get a little bit bitter and discontent and just a little bit discouraged because, again, we're not as knowledgeable or as dedicated or as gifted as someone else. And, and Jesus taught about this. They asked, uh, in one occasion, Jesus was teaching, and um, in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 12, he, um, he was talking to some religious leaders that were constantly asking him different questions. And Jesus said, he told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness, and scorned everyone else. And Jesus said there was two men who went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. And if you know anything about tax collectors, the reason they were despised is because they were Jews that had basically sold their soul to the Roman Empire, collecting taxes and collecting dues from from the, the Jewish people, right, from their own people in order to give to Rome. But not only that, it was notorious that they would overcharge. So if you owed $500, well, I'm going to say you owed $800. I'll give the $500 to Rome and I'll pocket the other $300. And there were known thieves and everybody despised them to the point where they would say tax collectors and sinners, right? They wouldn't even include them with the sinners. They were beyond that. They were worse than that because not only were they thieves, but they were considered traitors, right? So they were, there was a despised collector there and a religious Pharisee. And it says here in verse 11 that the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. This is his prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers, and I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. So we see here this guy, just like Jesus said, or the scripture says, right? He has great confidence in his own righteousness. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that you perhaps don't pray like this. I don't pray like this. I don't pray, God, thank you. I'm not like such and such, right? I'm not as bad as such and such. And although we don't pray like this, definitely not in public, <clears throat> right? Um, but at times, do we not have these type of thoughts, though? Maybe not this graphic or this, you know, precise, but, but how many times do we not perhaps hear about somebody that perhaps is going through some type of difficulty at work or in their family or in their marriage? And we're quick to think, you know, well... If you would take the things of the Lord seriously, if you would come to church, you know, more than once every three months or whatever, as if we're better than them because we come to church every week or whatever. Right. Or perhaps we see somebody, you know, in public at Walmart or a restaurant and their kid is just having a moment and just misbehaving or being whatever and just, you know, having a, a rant, you know, on the floor. Buy me this or whatever. And we're like, you know, we. We quietly think it's like, man, my kid would never do that. Or if you don't have kids yet, right? You're like, man, I will never let my kid do that. All right. Okay. I'll wait till you have kids, right? But, but at times we would have that. Or, or one of my pet peeves is when I see somebody driving a car and they're smoking inside the car with their windows up with their kids in the back. I'm sorry. They're, that's, uh, uh, that's a pet peeve of mine. I hate that. But then again... I left my kid eat chicken nuggets, you know, and all kinds of junk food all the time. That's probably just as bad for his health and for his growth and all these different stuff. Maybe not for his lungs, but still, you know, so a lot of times we can have, you know, and insert your example there. Uh, but but at times we can have these type of thoughts where we compare ourselves to other, where we think we can be better than others. 
So today I want to talk about a little bit about a text that, that Paul shared with this uh, with this church that he um, he was um, he planted. And, and I just want to give you a little bit of context. See, Paul was a new convert. Paul went from being one of these religious Pharisees, which, again, we already read that they had great confidence on themselves, on their own righteous works. Right. And um, he became a Jesus follower. And, uh, you know, he became a church planter and he would start these new works. Well, he's talking to a new church that was, you know, just growing. It had Jews in the church and it also had some Gentiles that were converting over to being Jesus followers. And again, Paul was just teaching about Jesus and his death and, uh, you know, all these different things about, you know, God's grace. And that is by his grace that we're saved. But what happens when the Gentiles were being saved and converted to Christian Christianity, there were some Jews there that were also Christians, but because they had grown up in Judaism, they had that whole that religion just deep inside of them. And uh, what they were doing is that they were going up to these new Gentile converts and they were saying, hey, I'm glad that you have believed in Jesus, but believing Jesus is not enough in order for you to be a real Christian. Right. You have to not only believe in Jesus, but you also have to, um, you know, you have to implement the law of Moses. So they would tell them, yeah, you have to, you know, you can't eat these foods and you have to keep this particular diet, right? This kosher diet. There's things about your hygiene, right? Um, the way that you wash your hands or, and also the, the, the keep, keeping the Sabbath was a big deal to them. So there's certain things that you can't do on, on the Sabbath day, right? On Saturdays and this and the other. And to the male converts, they would say, and because you're a man, you also got to be circumcised because that's what we did, right? So basically that we're saying, what they were saying is, hey, believing in Jesus, hey, good job, that's great, but it's just not enough, right? Believing in Jesus is good, but it's not enough. And Paul in this text in the book of Philippians, he confronts this mentality because unfortunately this doesn't just happen in Bible times, Unfortunately, this still happens today in churches today where believing in Jesus is OK, but you got to keep all the sacraments. You got to keep all these different things. You got to do this, this and the other because believing in Jesus is good, but it's not enough. And that's why this that's the context of what we see in Philippians chapter three, verses four through eight. And we're going to read it in its entirety. Or we're going to read it and I'm just going to make, you know, I'm just going to pause and make some commentary to give you a little bit of explanation of what is it that Paul is saying. So let's start in verse four, where Paul says, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. OK, so here basically Paul is going to rattle off. His resume. He's going to tell us the reasons why if anybody has confidence in their own righteousness, he's going to give us a list of seven things. Right. That make him if 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 being confident in your own effort was a thing, he could have it because he's going to list seven things. And again, in the Hebrew mind, we've talked about this before. The number seven is a very significant number. The number seven means perfection. The number seven means completion. The number seven is very significant. It means wholeness. And he's going to list seven specific things, four of them, which he, he, he basically was, um, it was just attributed to him at birth. He didn't have to work for those, four of them. But then the last three, it's something that he worked for and that he achieved. So um, again, he's going to rattle off Seven things in his resume. Uh, so he's about to tell us why he is so good. So let's continue with verse five, starting with the first one. He says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. Again, that was the tradition that was in the law, right? That a Jewish kid, baby, had to be circumcised on the eighth day. Why the eighth day? Well, interestingly enough, now that medicine has advanced, we now know that it's until the eighth day of the human 
boy of the, of the human body of a male uh, baby that there is a chemical inside the body that helps to coagulate the blood. It's amazing that God knew all these kind of things and put it into the law. No, circumcise a baby after the eighth day or on the eighth day because that's when it'll be able to heal and everything else. Um, so I thought that was just an interesting detail. But he continues in verse 5, he says, I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. Meaning, hey, I didn't convert to Judaism. I was born into it, right? A member and a member of the tribe of of Benjamin. Again, these are things that he didn't achieve. These are things that were just simply attributed to him because of where he was born, the family he was born to. And being of the tribe of Benjamin was significant because Jerusalem was in Benjamite territory. And if you know a little bit about your Old Testament, you know that the Benjamites, right, the, the tribe of Benjamin were one of the few tribes that actually remained faithful to King David when the Israel divided into the North Kingdom and the, and the, the South Kingdom. But more importantly than that, the first king of Israel, which we know was King Saul, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. And many scholars believe that that's the reason why Paul's previous name was Saul. He was named after the first king of Israel, Saul. And uh, basically what Paul's saying, that he's a member of the tribe of Benjamin, he's saying, hey, I'm not only from this land, but I'm from the right family, right? I'm from the right place. Basically, he's saying, hey, do you know who my daddy was, right? Do you know where I come from? Do you know who I am? So again, he is telling them, hey, I am I'm, you know, circumcised on the eighth day, pure-blooded citizen of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, that's three. And what does he say? A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. So basically he's saying, not only do I speak the tongue of my ancestors, right, the Greek and Hebrew, but he's basically saying, no, I also speak Aramaic and perhaps Latin. So he was, again, um, a Hebrew, if there ever was one. I love the translation in Spanish, que dice, soy hebreo de pura cepa, right? So basically, he's saying like, hey, if I got, you know, uh, if I got to flex my card here, like, you know, I, I am one of the real, I'm the real deal. Now, those are the things that were simply attributed to him just by being born in the family that he was born, in the culture that he was born. But then these last three things are things that, um, that he earned, that he worked for. He says, I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law, right? Because we already established that they found their identity and worth in their religious works. They had a lot of confidence in their own righteousness. Verse 6, I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, Right? He was saying, I was so faithful to my belief. I was so zealous about my um, religion, about my upbringing, about the doctrine that I have adopted as my own, that when these Christians started preaching around about a resurrected Messiah, this and the other, and I was seeing my Jewish brothers and sisters convert over to this new sect, I didn't just stand by and let it happen. No, no, no. I persecuted them. I arrested these believers. I went house to house, to house taking them under custody, having some of them killed under my authorization. That's how zealous I was. And as for righteousness, verse 6, he says, I obeyed the law without fault. Now, you and I, we know about the Ten Commandments. We probably couldn't name the Ten Commandments, but we know about the Ten Commandments. The Pharisees, though, they held... Uh, to about 613 commandments. And Paul's saying here, according to the law, I was considered faultless, right? As for righteousness, I, ob I obeyed the law without fault. But then what does it say in, um, in verse 7? It says, I once thought that these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done for me. Yes, Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage. Now, that word garbage in the text is actually a PC word in the Greek. That was a curse word, right? The word scubula or scubala, right? 
It's a word that starts with shh and it ends with something else. He's like, I consider everything a pile of, you know what, compared to knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all as a pile of garbage so that I could gain Christ and because and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. The way that God makes us right with himself It's not through my righteous works. No, it all depends on what he did and me simply believing it and receiving it by faith. So what is Paul saying with this whole text? He's saying, hey, I lived that life. I had the success. I had the position. I had the money. I had the influence, right? I had the authority. I had all of those things. And what he's saying is that there is no joy in that, kind of, in that kind of living because that kind of living leads to, a, to the trap of either pride, of arrogance, or, you know, discontentment and bitterness or whatever, depending on who you are comparing yourself with. There's no joy in that. The, the comparison trap will always lead us to sin and it will never lead us to a good place. And it's a shame. It's a shame Um, that this not only and this wasn't only happening in the times of the Bible, um, Christians and even churches today, they fall into this trap even today, imposing man made religious rules and regulations in order to gain right standing with the Lord. Right. And I, I do believe that some of these things they're established because of good intentions I don't know how many people um, you've been to churches like this or you know people that that go to churches like this. Maybe churches that perhaps uh, don't allow women to to wear, you know, modern clothes. You got to wear long skirts. You can't, you know, put makeup on or perhaps don't shave or whatever. And again, I believe that the intention originally perhaps was good, right, to teach the women about being modest and humble, about focusing more on the inner beauty instead of, you know, the out, outer beauty or whatever, right? Or perhaps churches that have a dress code that you could never go with just simply a pair of jeans or a shirt or shorts or whatever, and God forbid you wear a hat in church. And again, I do believe that the original intent was to teach reverence and respect and to honor the house of the Lord and all that. Again, I do believe that some of these churches, they implement these things with the right intention, right? Or perhaps, you know, this whole condemning attitude about, you know, no smoking, no drinking, no dancing, no rated R movies. And again, there's good intention behind that. And originally, I'm convinced that, that their intention is to protect your mind and your heart from the things that, that um, you know, that, that, that bog us down or that, that influence us in the ways of the world. And all of those things are great. But unfortunately, with time, What, what inevitably happens is that our man-made rules get lifted up to the same level as Scripture. And then it just simply becomes a guideline for me to compare myself or to judge other people. Well, look at what she's doing. Look at what he's wearing. Look at what they're doing. Right? So although the intentions are good, and, and yes, I do believe that, that churches are like, flavors of ice cream, right? There's all kinds of different ice creams because a lot of people like different things. There's a lot of different people that like different types of churches, and there's people that thrive in that environment. They need that structure. They need that religiosity, right, and, that, and those strict rules of what you can and can't do, and God bless them, right? But the problem lies in when they raise those up to the same level of Scripture, And that's when they get in trouble because they're not only trusting in the grace and the goodness of God, but now I got my check mark. Check, I don't smoke. Check, I don't drink. Check, I don't dance. Check, I have no fun, right? Check, right? I'm a real Christian because I have no fun. You know what I'm saying? You ever been in those type? Or, you know what I'm saying? So, again, are you trusting in Christ or are you trusting in your list? Or are you trusting in, in your faithfulness? in your goodness, and your ability to follow rules. 
That's where people get trouble, get in trouble. And um, and that's why, again, um, it, it's 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 the reason why as a church and as a leader, I never want us to become a religious and, and legalistic um, type of environment or a church. And, and you and, and I hope that you you get that, you know, and, and again, it doesn't mean that, oh, you could do whatever. No, no, no. I just I just want to give um, space for the Holy Spirit to bring that conviction. But when it comes to our church, when it comes to the message that I preach, that I teach, that I believe, I want us to be um, just cling to the purity of the gospel. All right. The purity of the gospel. And to finish today, I want to share what that is. I want to share with you the three truths of the gospel, of the good news. Why is good news that Jesus came and died for us? And, and we're going to read this text in its entirety in Romans 3, verses 20 through 22. The word of God says this. For no one can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now, God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, no matter who we are. This portion of scripture, I believe, shows us the purity of the gospel. What are those three points? Number one, the first important truth is that you cannot be made right with God. You cannot earn right standing with God by following rules. You can't do it. It doesn't matter how many good things you do, how many bad things you have stopped doing. You can't earn right standing with God. That's what the scripture tells us in verse 20. No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. No one ever can be made right by God by doing what the law commands. Isaiah verse 64, chapter 64, verse 6 tells us this. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, when we go to God with our little list and we say, God, look, look, I woke up early today. I read my Bible. I prayed. I shared my faith at work. Like I went to church this week. I went to small group. I helped an old lady across the street. I bought my neighbor groceries. I mowed their lawn. Look at everything, all the good things that I've done. God says, all of your righteous works, all your righteous deeds, they're nothing but filthy rags. Filthy rags. That word doesn't even do it justice because in the original language, that's talking about a menstrual cloth. You know what that is. That's disgusting. And that's not talking about our bad deeds. That's not talking about our thoughts, our bad thoughts, our bad intentions, our dark heart at times. No, no, no. It's talking about our righteous deeds. They're like menstrual cloths to the Lord. So no one, no one can be made right with God by following rules, which leads us to point number two. The purpose of the law is to show us our need for a savior. The purpose of the law is simply to show us our need for a savior. The text said it clearly in verse 20, part B. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. That's the purpose of it. The law was never to, hey, follow this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule, then you'll be okay. No. The purpose of the law is to show us this, 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 and the other. Oh, crap. I've fallen in all of them. Right? That's why Jesus said uh, to the religious leaders, hey, you follow Scripture and you look at Scripture thinking that it will lead you to eternal life? No. The Scripture simply points you to me. It points you to the fact that you need a Savior and Paul talked about this in Romans chapter 7. He says, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would have never known that coveting was wrong if the law did not say you must not covet. 
You must not covet. You must not want what somebody else wants. You must not envy, right? If the law didn't say it, I wouldn't know that I was doing it, that I was wrong, that I was sinful. And because I am sinful, I need to be saved from that sin. The purpose of the law is simply to show us that we need a Savior. That we need a Savior. So, again, when we think that we are in right standing with God because of our works, the law is the one that shows us, no, you have tripped and fell. You have fallen. You have broken the law. I mean, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever wanted what somebody else had? Have you envied what somebody else had that you don't have? Have you ever uh, put other things in front of God at times? Have you ever disrespected, disobeyed, or un dishonored your parents? We've all done those things. Those are just four out of the Ten Commandments, and we've already broken all of them. Because the law's purpose is to show us you can't be saved on your own. You need a Savior. Point number three. Purity of the gospel. At its essence, our foundation is that being made right with God is only possible with faith in Christ. That's the only way. Being made right with God is only possible by faith, putting our faith in Christ. And we see this in verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes no matter who they are, no matter who they are, no matter who they are. Does that include somebody that has doubts? Yeah, it includes you. No matter who they are, does that include somebody that has a dark past that has made perhaps some bad decisions? Yes, it also includes you. Does that include somebody that suffers with addictions? Yes, it includes that person as well. It includes the person that grew up in church. It includes the person that has never stepped in church. It includes the person who has lived a fairly moral life and a person that has lived a life, a life of recklessness. It's true for no matter who. This is, this is true for everyone who believes no matter who they are because the truth is that religion, religion focuses on what you do on what you accomplish, on your faithfulness. Christianity is different. Christianity focuses on what Christ has done. Religion says do, and then you can come to see if you're accepted by God. Christianity says, no, no, no. You come just as you are. I accept you just as you are. I'll change you in the process. I'll change you. And as I change you, You'll want to do things not because you have to, but because you're grateful. Because of you simply want to worship the God that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't wait for us to get our act together. No, while we were still sinners, Christ came. He lived the life we could not live and died the death we deserve to die so that we could be saved. Now, the pushback comes. Some people might say, well, Aniba, that sounds too easy. You know, and perhaps you're having that thought. You're saying, Aniba, you can't just preach grace. It doesn't matter what you do. That means that people are going to believe in God and they live however the heck they want. They can just do whatever they want and they be called a Christian? No. No. Because the mark of a person that has truly believed, the mark of a, of a heart that has truly understand, that has truly understood what their sins deserved and what Jesus did in order to pay for them, in order to make them saved, forgiven, redeemed, adopted into the family of God, a heart that has truly understood what Jesus did for them on the cross, that person that truly understands is not looking to see how they can take advantage of God's grace. But their response is, Jesus, you gave everything for me. I give you my life. Jesus, you died for me. I want to live for you. That's the heart. That's the attitude. That's the focus. That's the way a life is marked of somebody that has truly understand 
that has truly understood I don't have to work my way to get to God. No, Jesus split that veil so that I could come boldly before the throne of God. I don't want to take advantage of the grace of God. Advantage meaning like I don't want to take it. No me quiero aprovechar, right? I don't know how to say that, pero I, I don't want to just like menospreciarla. I, I want to cherish it i want to do i want to worship i want to serve i want to be faithful not to earn your approval not to earn your forgiveness not to earn your love no 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 because you have accepted me because you have forgiven me because you have taken me out of the dark path that i was in and put me in the path of righteousness because of that i want to live for you i want to honor you i want to seek you i want to know you So the heart that truly understands what Jesus did on the cross for your sins is not somebody that's just going to treat God's grace as, oh yeah, well, it's by grace, so I can do whatever I want. Then you don't have it. You don't understand it. And you probably haven't received it. And you need to go before God and confess. And, and, if, and if you truly want to do this, that's the heart and the mark of a true believer. Now, earlier, I read you that story that Jesus was telling about these two guys that went to the temple. Remember, one of them was a religious leader, a Pharisee, right? That when he prayed, he stood by himself and he said, thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Thank you, God, that I'm not a cheater or a sin or adulterer. And I'm definitely not like that tax collector. No, no, no. I I fast twice a week. I give my money to the church. I read my Bible. I know the law. I serve the community. I, I, I. That's what this religious guy was doing. Focusing what? On himself. What did Jesus say? He says, but the tax collector, remember? The one that was despised. The one that was hated. The one that was considered a, a traitor. The one that was on a classification and a list all by himself, even apart from sinners. No, no, no. He's on a list all by himself. The tax collector, he stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. I tell you this, Jesus said, this sinner and not The Pharisee returned home justified by God for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The tax collector acknowledged his sin, acknowledged there's nothing I can do. I can't earn right standing with God. I have definitely broken the law and it shows me I need a savior. So I come before you, God, acknowledging I'm a sinner. Jesus said it was this guy that went home redeemed, that went home forgiven, justified, saved. Not the religious guy focusing on all his good works. So who are you? In what category do you fall? Are you trusting to be in right standing with God by the fact that you're a moral person? You might think, I'm a moral person. I have a job. I pay my taxes. I take care of my family. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but who's perfect, right? It's interesting that when people say, well, I'm not perfect, but, you know, Well, it's interesting that by saying you're not perfect, you're acknowledging that there is a perfect that you are not. And that is the goal. That is the standard that God has set is perfection, is holiness. And we all fall short. We're all sinners. We're all condemned. We're already condemned. But by faith, if we believe, if we receive the gift of grace, We can be saved. We can be forgiven. And just like this tax collector, we can go home justified. So, so who are you? are you? Are you trusting in your own effort that you're a good parent? I take care of my family. You know, I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't do this, this, and the other. Or 
Do you acknowledge that you're a sinner separated from God and that you need a savior? I acknowledged my sin years ago and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I have to confess my sin every week. Every, every week, every day. Um, but man, I want to invite you today. Today was a simple message, but I don't know who needs it. And I don't know where it is that you stand in your journey with the Lord. But it starts here. It starts with a step of obedience, a step of humility. Because Christianity is for the humble, right? Right? It's for the ones that can acknowledge, I can't earn it. I'm not good enough. Jesus, I need you. If you're still trusting in your own effort, your own morality, hey, good luck with that. But if you want to follow Christ, if you want to place your faith in him, it starts with an instant of faith, simple gratitude for the gift that he offers you through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's close our eyes and I'll, let's pray. And today I want to invite you to put your faith in Christ. So, Father, thank you for the purity of the gospel. Thank you for your amazing grace, God, that while we were yet sinners, when we were blind, when we were lost, God, you came and you died for us. You paid the sin debt that we owed. You covered it, God, and now you offer us the gift of salvation. God, we were that wayward sheep that ran away. We were that prodigal son that ran away. But now you're calling us home. And God, I pray for every person here that has not yet placed their faith in Christ. I pray that through the simplicity of the purity of, God, of the gospel, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will go beyond my human words, and I pray that you will do the work that only you can do, that you may touch their hearts, convince them of their need for a Savior, and that it only takes an instant of faith for you to come into their life and change it, God, and transform them. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you're here today, and like this tax collector, today you want to acknowledge your sin and your need for a Savior. If you have never placed your faith in Christ, if you are not sure that if you die today, you will go to heaven when you die. If you don't have the assurance of your salvation, today I want to invite you to put your faith in Christ. Again, for the salvation of your soul and the forgiveness of your sins. Right there where you are, just simply raise your hand and lower right back down. I just want to pray for you today. This is step number one. This is where we begin. Just raise your hand and lower it right back down to begin a relationship with God. If you want to be humble before the Lord and acknowledge your need for a Savior, just raise your hand and lower it right back down. I just want to pray for you. Father, you know every heart and you know where every, every person stands in their journey with you. I pray, God, that again, that you will continue at work in this person, that this message may not go out in one ear and out the other. But God, allow your Holy Spirit to trickle this down to their heart and convince them of their need to be saved. Because apart from you, God, we can't do anything. So if you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Christ, I just want to lead you through this, this simple prayer. Again, this prayer doesn't save you. But I believe that God knows you. He sees your heart. And if you seek him, you will find him. So just say, Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you lived the perfect and sinless life that I haven't been able to live. Jesus, I believe that you died the death of a sinner because you died in my place. And today, Jesus, I repent for my sins. And I invite you into my heart. I receive your sacrifice on the cross. 
as payment for my sin. I believe that it was sufficient. Jesus, I believe that you were buried and that you rose again on the third day. And that you are alive today, seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Help me to live the rest of my days for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, it's a start. I pray that you tell somebody. Don't keep it alone. Don't keep it to yourself. Share with somebody that you said, hey, I didn't raise my hand, but, but I did say that prayer. I do mean it from the heart. Just tell somebody that you put your faith in Christ. And I want to say, if you did, welcome to the family of God. Praise God. Let's give God a hand for the goodness of his grace, for his amazing grace and the purity of the gospel. Praise God. Thank you again for coming. Thank you to those that joined us online. I want to remind you that during the week, we are carrying out our Bible studies on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, are the youth meeting on Thursdays also? Uh, so if you have a middle or high school student, make sure that you contact Chris um, so that you can get that information. But Tuesdays at 6 p.m., Wednesdays at 6.30, Tuesdays in English, Wednesdays in Spanish. Uh, if you're not yet connected to a small group where you can study the Bible together, pray together, we have Tuesday 6 a.m. prayer as well if you're interested in that. Um, you're always welcome. You're always invited. And, and that's really the way to really connect with one another. Uh, next I, I want to give an announcement in the next couple of weeks, but um, I'll give you more detail in the next couple of weeks. But, but um, I do want to start, I think in the month of June, um, some classes, just a one-time course that if you simply want to know more about the gospel, if you want to know more about baptism, we have some people that are interested in getting baptized um, we want to do at one time, maybe after church, we'll go, we'll get you lunch, and then we'll spend some time um, going over this information so that hopefully in the next few weeks, we can get some of you baptized to declare, uh, I have died with Christ, raising with him to a new life. So if you're interested in that, um, you know, you know uh, contact me or, or let me know. But I'll give you more information about when and how and, and how that's going to be carried out. But uh, and also, uh, pretty soon, God willing, I don't know where, we'll, we'll talk to our leadership team, but we'll probably go out to the park uh, to enjoy the summer weather here pretty soon. Um, so again, uh, all of that information will be coming soon. So thank you for coming. God bless you. Have a beautiful rest of your day and a great week. And I'll see you uh, next Sunday. Que Dios le bendiga.